Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Hub24 is on a mission to empower advisors to deliver better financial futures for their clients. They are dedicated to customer service excellence and delivering innovative product solutions that create value for advisors and their clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors rate them number one for overall satisfaction and why their managed portfolio solution has been rated best in market five years running. Hub24 believes nothing happens in isolation. So they're working together with advisors, licensees, and industry leaders to leverage their data and technology expertise to help solve key challenges in the delivery of financial advice so more Australians can access cost-effective advice. Uh, g'day, Clayton here from XY Advisor. It's been it's been a, a little while since I've done a podcast, but uh, I got to chat with Andrew at the XY um, event in Sydney the other day, and I thought it was super interesting. So I've dragged myself out of retirement, and I want to welcome you, mate, here today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Clayton. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I I found the latest event. At, with XY, it was super interesting because COVID obviously split, essentially split the event, the singular event into two events. So it was, we did education digitally, but we kept the, the boozing element uh, until it was actual, you know, uh, so that we could do it in person. And um, I met some super interesting advisors. There was an advisor there who's a pilot, an wow. actual commercial pilot, still a commercial pilot. Yeah, right. And has his own financial planning business. And all of his clients, commercial pilots. So, <laughs> oh, wow. There you go. What a niche. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I know. I was speaking to him and, uh, and uh, I said, well, what, what's, your, um, what's your client acquisition strategy? He goes, it's very simple. I get rostered onto a flight, sit next to someone for 12 hours. And by the time we land, they're my client. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. You're trapped. <laughs> exactly. I like I it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hilarious. And then um and then we got chatting uh about you know you had a really interesting uh niche as well. And as a general rule, I think financial planning is just walking into the space of the hyper niche. Would you tend to agree to that? Yeah, definitely think so. The the, the niche just allows you to stand out and be an expert and know how to approach your client base and what to say to them. And I think yeah, more and more that's just become so important to have have yeah. that hyper niche that you know back to front. Yeah, yeah. Ben, Ben, and buddy of mine and, and on the on the board here at XY, Ben Nash, he's gotten really involved in the in like the tech scene, you know, like Google and mm. Microsoft and all those cats over there. And um and so employee share schemes. He just knows everything about employee share yes. schemes and ESOP yeah. pools and all that sort of stuff. And he's just hyper niched into that. Uh then you've got your airline pilots that are hyper niching into airline pilots and mm. uh and then you are hyper niching uh, not just in uh because because previously you were niched but now you've even gone in a further step and you've got this awesome kind of story of being involved in a in a high quality licensee and then deciding to to go self-licensed and go even further hyper niched and uh, yeah, the, the story I just think has so many elements to it. So do you want to maybe give us a little bit of a background on how you got into advice? And even if your background, is that why you even started at your first niche? Or, 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 or how did you even niche in the first place before you even got to where you are now? Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, I'll dive in. Thanks, Clayton. Um, yeah, so I've been in financial services. I sort of fell into it 20 years ago. My dad was a financial advisor, but I didn't hurry to follow in his footsteps. And then um, I think what I mean, what, what happened, my dad had a, a stroke um, when he was 59. And so I was probably, I think I was 23 at the time. And I was working for, for Zurich in advisor support type role. 
And that was a massive shift. Like um, my dad managed the whole family finances and um, my mum just had her whole life turned upside down because he was heavily brain damaged. And so he was sort of no, no longer there to support mum and the family and everything. And then six months later, I was working for a small advice business practice. And I just saw the way it was my dad's old business partner uh, helping my mom and it didn't work very well. Like I think he just put so much pressure on her and said the learning curve is super steep. And um, and I just saw how <laughs> the finances just added massive stress to my mom already during a, a really tough time for her. So look, that's how I sort of found myself in financial advice and I was um, I was an associate working for a small it was a risk practice at the time and then I um, I wasn't there too long and I moved to IPAC which was Paul Clitheroe's company a lot of people might know and um, and they had a, a specialist uh, like a personal injury type um, offer they had a national legal um, uh, relationship manager who had relationships with law firms around the country and it was people having serious um, illnesses or injuries or accidents and, and, and getting settlements and things like that. So I aligned myself with that part of the business at IPAC very quickly, and that was um, the area we were in. And so I was at IPAC for a long time. It was a great company to work for, as anyone would know if you were there. It's um, changed, and change is going on right now. Um, AXA purchased them, and then AMP took over AXA, and now it's sort of being fully integrated into AMP. So there's a lot of changes along the way. And look, I, I loved it there. We had great advisors and a great niche in personal injury. Um, but there was this, most of what we were doing was large, catastrophic, quarter-pointed lump sums. And we did a little bit of this work in, in super and insurance. So most Australians have uh, death and TPD insurance and maybe income protection through their super funds. And there's, we, we estimate about 20,000 people are getting a TPD claim through super uh, every year. And these people just don't know where to go. T TPD claim gets approved, it gets paid into your super account. And, um, and then you've got all these choices. There's all these different financial implications. There's a different tax rate for everybody. There's so many pitfalls people can fall into and so many opportunities and unique financial strategies that um, people can take advantage of. So I was thinking more about that. And that's when I, I left. Um, I actually went from IPAC to Perpetual for a little while because they have a big personal injury presence. And then very quickly, I decided I want to do my own business and, um, and, and set up my own business licensed through Fitzpatrick's, like you mentioned. And they were great. I had a lot of ex-advisors move to Fitzpatrick's that I used to work with. And I knew some of the managers and great business. But um, yeah, I just found as Fitzpatrick's got bigger, a fantastic place, but um, my niche was just so different to what everybody else was doing. And I kept wanting to do things and create this website and build this tax calculated tool and do all these things. And Fitzpatrick's were not sure about a lot of that or taking months to get back to me to approve things. And I wanted to do things a little bit of a different way. And that's when I found XY Advisor, actually. So this was um, probably early last year. And XY Advisor was fantastic because pretty much every advisor I knew was employed or working with a big licensee and I didn't know too many self-employed advisors and and I think the licensees sort of scare you off that a little bit and especially in the current climate and how you're going to get insurance and don't go self-license whatever you do um <laughs> but but I remember XY yeah it was so good I reached out to some people they said do it you won't look back and they put me in touch with other people and compliance consultants I remember coming away from my first XY function last year and just dictating heaps of notes from, uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was like Christmas party last year and I'd already gone to set up my license and we sat around a table and like four out of seven of us had already just set up our license through the same person. It was, it was crazy. Wow. But, so that's what happened in November last year, went self-licensed, as you said, and, um, and now the business is pretty much um, focused on TPD claims through super. And we still do a bit of the more general personal injury stuff, but it's it's very narrow because you, you can just see people are Googling it all the time. You know, how does the tax work? What are the Centrelink implications on TPD claims through super? Um, there's a huge amount of misinformation there. They've gone and spoken to their local accountant, advisor, ATO, and they've all given three different answers about how it works and it's tax-free or it's 22% tax or, you know, so it's... um. Yeah, so that that that's uh, sort of how I ended up where I am today. We've just recruited our first uh, advisor. So he's a, a guy I used to work with at IPAC, and that's been massive, you know. So I've just been able to um, – he's helped me a lot with the advice piece and production, and he used to manage a big 
book of clients at IPAC. And so now I can get out there and start promoting it again, which will be great. So, Mate, what a journey. That That's amazing. Um, I actually yeah. didn't realise there was such a strong subculture of self-aligned um, or self-licensed advisors in, in XY. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there, there you go. Like uh, the, the stuff, it's kind of interesting, um, the stuff that I get to find out about you know the, the 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 members that have joined XY over the years. It blows my mind all the time. Um, I think it's good diversity there, you know. And there's a big shift going on, right? So there is a lot of movement and people reviewing where they're at and the licensee factor. And yeah, not saying there's a right or wrong, but yeah, different different people need a different support system, don't they? So absolutely. And and realistically, that that's exactly why um, why we started this is is a support system for whatever it is that you want to deliver as an advisor. And so I super interesting uh, Genesis story that you have there. So, um, you know, there's a personal reason, then it reflects into your professional growth. And then over time, you've just hyper, hyper, hyper niched uh, into um, people that are, w- w- would you say, because you haven't used this terminology, but do you then see yourselves as as a claims specialist yeah good question not at all really yeah because um, <laughs> you didn't say that because i've heard someone yeah. call themselves that previously uh, but you haven't used that terminology so what would be the yeah. difference between a claims specialist and what you're talking about yeah i'm seeing them after the claim's been approved so i definitely get those inquiries if you put in tpd claims assistance mm. into google you'll get 50, you get heaps of results, right? If you're looking for a like a claim or TPD claim financial advisor or someone after approval, it's really narrow. There's just not a lot of help out there. I can definitely put people in touch with different claims, support people or lawyers if they need that or, you know, there's a lot of different. So I know a lot about it, but no, my business is very much after the claim has been approved and nobody's right. doing that very well. Like, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I remember, um, and it goes to show you how long it's been since since I gave advice. Certainly ar- around, uh, certainly around what to do with the TPD payout. But I remember um, getting super stuck in to, and you might you'll probably be able to explain it to me. But super stuck in on all of the finer, minute details. And, and there was there were certain things where certain amounts would be calculated at this and then other amounts that were calculated like that. And I remember I ended up creating like this behemoth spreadsheet and it was still probably wrong because I couldn't, I, I, I wasn't entirely satisfied, but I remember it being a huge hole that I just spent maybe like two weeks running down. Um, and in the end, it, my business didn't really do any of it. So I, I sort of didn't, have a chance to get thoroughly involved in it but by the sounds of it your that is now your second nature and and i don't i don't i'd actually like to go through some of the stuff what what are some of the more interesting aspects of what you can do with a tpd payout yeah thanks clayton i mean i will try not to you know i could talk about this all day so i'll try and keep <laughs> it short and sharp but first of all tpd through super a difference to tpd outside of super that's paid to you directly tax-free it has you know they're, they're obviously the usual financial planning implications there but tpd paid into super totally different right it goes into your super account first you then get a form from the super funds do you want to do a partial or a full withdrawal when you're taking that money out of super there's this standard tax rate this is before you turn 60 or preservation age it's 22 percent but you get this special calculation which is Basically, from when you stop working to 65, it's the future period you couldn't work. What's that called? The tax-free uplift. or the, That's it, yeah. yeah tax-free uplift, yeah. So th- there's a lot to talk about there, right? The date last worked is grey. Super funds make mistakes there quite often. It's a proportion um, that future period you couldn't work is the tax-free portion of your uh, as a proportion of your total working life, which goes back to eligible service date. So you run into all these problems with uh, eligible service dates. If you consolidate, they always keep the earlier one. You know, we had super legislation come out two years ago to automatically consolidate funds. This has been massively problematic in the TPD space because someone gets a quote from their fund saying your tax rate is going to be 1%. And then all of a sudden they go and make a big withdrawal and they've been charged 10%. 
And the reason is that eligible service state, that automatic rollover came in off, sometimes without them knowing. So it's a huge minefield. Some dodgy there. like REST super <laughs> fund that they had 20 yeah, exactly. years ago gets this tag yeah, along. Exactly. They're like, there. it was $300 from a REST fund I had 20 years ago. I'm like, I'm oh. sorry, it's not, the, it's not the quantum, it's the eligible service state piece. Now, as part of a, a, a law association, I mean, we've tried to lobby the ATO and the government for carve-outs around that, but, but that's not been successful. And there's also the thinking that really it is meant to take into account your total working life. It's just that people with multiple super accounts have totally different tax tax treatment. So we yeah. often get people with, with two TBD claims, and this one they're, they're going to pay super low tax rate on. Some of the times it's almost entirely tax-free, and the other one has a really high tax rate. So... We might segregate accounts. Um, you know, they might take from one and leave the other for, for post 60 if they can. They're, they're, and there's a whole bunch of things from there. If you leave your money where it is, they don't do that tax free uplift until you do a withdrawal or a rollover. So you're relying on that fund to do this calculation going forward. Medical certificates can expire after 12 months. So then most of the time, 12, 18 months or two years, you have to resupply those to keep getting that tax free uplift. There's a way around that. You can roll over to lock in that big tax-free uplift on, on rollover. So there's all these unique strategies. I mean, there's the you can contribute to the fund before the rollover. Um, if you do this non-concessional, it increases the power of the tax-free uplift. So some people can wash out the taxable component and use super going forward. Oh, yeah. They can take, they can take lump sum withdrawals or they can start a pension like a retired Australian would, and that totally changes the tax treatment. Wait, wait, so, wait, wait. You <clears> can start a okay. pension? Before the eight, before preservation aid. Yes. So Get out of them, town. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love the enthusiasm. So uh, yes. Yeah, no, I love great. this stuff. Wait, wait, wait. You can, I just I did not know that. I, I oh should back God. up a step. That's exactly right. So when this claim is approved through super, it all becomes unrestricted, non-preserved. Their existing super and their TPD amount because they've met the permanent incapacity condition of release. All you need to start a pension is, is meet that and have it fully unrestricted, non-preserved, so you can start a pension, right? Wow. Yeah. So heaps of our clients do that. They start a Wait, pension. Wait, do you still get the low rate cap in, in that environment because of, 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 of a capital amount you can pull out before it enters into that taxable environment? So the low rate cap is for people over preservation age and under 60. Yes. And it used to be 55. It's working its way up to 60. People That's we see right. these days, if they're 58, depending yep, on which yep, side yep. of 1 July they were born, yep. they still get, it's now 225,000, the low rate cap. Absolutely. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's I, pretty, I, was th- I was thinking it was any time before the age of 60, but it's not any time. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. I mean, yeah, as yeah, you yeah. can see, it's pretty, pretty unique. Super. Pretty Man. Pretty so, right. so yeah, yeah. before we move on, yeah. do, you, do you know anyone? under even age let's call it let's go super young like previous preservation age the youngest was 55 so do you know anyone on a pension under the age of 55 yeah yeah for sure most of our clients are in their 40s it just so happens that way we have some in their 30s some in their 50s and you get the odd person in their 60s but most of them are in their 40s and they have a a, a, an allocate or an account-based pension yes yeah mate that is Honestly, mind blowing that I've never heard of that. I mean, we've just scratched the surface too. Like, there's so many unique. Like, if you start a pension in the fund where your TPD claim was, yeah, the whole income is taxable, and you get a 15 percent tax offset. But if you roll over, you're crystallizing that tax free amount. So it's only the taxable portion that's taxable. You can give your medicals to the new fund and get a 15 percent tax offset. So there's, there's a lot of and there's a lot of unique things to TPD, and, oh. and it's not. It, it's more than that as well. Like. All funds are a little bit different when it comes to implementing these things. So we track about 85 super funds. There's two out of those 85 that lock in the tax-free. So you can't do that washout piece on rollover because it's locked in, but the rest. So And there's all these things we try and track. Like, um, Wait, wait, but where are you getting, you must be getting that information from the PDS because there's no way that the client service person on the phone knows what you're talking about. It's actually just through experience and we, gotcha. and we talk to people because you don't get that in the PDS either. Oh. You, can't, you can't get that stuff. So <laughs> it's, all, it's all very hard to get answers on this stuff, but what? some funds are better than others. They write out to their member, you've been TPD, your medicals will expire in 12 months or 18 months, and so that's how we get that kind of information. And there's about five different metrics we try and track across these funds. I'll just say one more thing, like a massive issue for us last year in COVID was um, 
Some super funds will take the TPD and put it straight into the person's account and invest it in accordance with their default option. Most will, or maybe half, will put it into cash. And you can see already, and some will say after 90 days, we'll invest it. But during COVID, we had a bunch of super funds that automatically invested their TPD amount into the market at the perfect, you know, the, the worst possible timing. And so we had many, many people compensated because they didn't even know in some cases that their TPD had been approved several weeks ago and it's fallen, you know, 10, 20 percent. Oh, mate. So that, they're the types of things we try and track across funds because, and, and that's not in a PDS, that's just, this, that's just the fund procedures. And it's a lot of these cases, it's the fund not really giving heaps of thought to TPD. They just go, it's new oh. money, it's automatically invested like any other contribution to a fund i, I reckon so, a lot of a lot of times the payout there's not there's not well in my experience there's very little hand holding on the payout like it's very much like mm. we've done our job look at you know we're, and, and they should be they should be proud of the work that they're doing because they're actually paying the money but they feel like that, that is the the crux of it i've seen and and this is slightly outside of your lane but i'm sure you're very well aware of it so um, income protection within superannuation. Um, now, technically, it, it, if you have a, an IP or a, a, a TCP or whatever it's called, uh, claim inside a super, it's, the money should get paid to super and then you should claim the money from super into your own account. But I've seen people receive it directly into their bank account just bypassing superannuation altogether, even though the superannuation owns the income protection policy, mm-hmm. and uh, and so yeah, I've seen I've, yeah, I've seen some crazy stuff. Do you, do you know why that would have occurred, by any Well, actually, in most cases, they do pay it directly to the member, and there's special right. super condition to have it. Okay. But it can be it can be both ways. I mean, this is like you're saying; it's all super funds are a little bit different, and yeah, because uh, because I have experienced both but, both uh, ways. Yeah, yeah, one one of them. Yes, but but, but um. Mate, that's um, that's super interesting. It, um, it's interesting, and like you said about the handholding, this is my biggest thing. Like, I just think, um, first of all, my relationships were mostly with personal injury law firms, and so that's where a lot of my original work was coming from. And I'd go around the country saying, you can't just send these people a pre-completed withdrawal form uh, without them understanding all the financial implications and the choices and, and things yeah. like that. AIM goes for super funds, and I've tried a little bit. It's a bit harder with super funds, and there's a, a, often a lot of bureaucracy and things you've got to deal with. But they're just approving these TPD claims, putting into their account, sending them a nice letter. But often these people, I mean, it's hard enough for us in the industry to get our heads around what's involved and, and trying to understand it. And they, there isn't a lot of hand-holding. There's not a really good solution there for these people in a lot of yeah. cases. It's like yeah. I, I'm still, my mind's still blown about the... People under the age of fifty-five having an account management. <laughs> very rare. That's most of our. That's most of our clients. Yeah, and then so yeah, that's there's yeah, there's some really great unique opportunities for these people. Uh, they can take advantage of, and there's often they're on Centrelink payments in some cases because they haven't worked for years, so they're on a disability pension or something. Yeah. So that's got to be factored in, and how does this impact my disability pension? And yeah, you know, the, the answer there, it's all shielded in super while they're under age pension age, under 67. But as they start pulling money out, there can be implications. So that's a big yeah. piece as well. And you that's don't start an... a full pension in those cases. You might just start it with two or 250000 keeping them under the, the Centrelink means testing, and then the rest stays in accumulation um, where it's shielded. You know, so there's... But technically, once you get through that 250, you can just start another age. Uh, ABP anyway, right? Well, the um, the two hundred and fifty is more like the uh, Centrelink test? income test. No, this is a Centrelink means okay, testing, yeah. and that's the number at the moment in financial assets a person could have under the income test. Yep. So there's different asset test thresholds if they're single couple, homeowner, non homeowner. Yep. And under the income test, a single or a couple, it, it just works out to be about two hundred and fifty at the moment under the current Centrelink deeming rates. Yep. So then that's why you might limit it to that much. Again, it's different for everybody. If they have but, any other, but one, once you pulled that entire two hundred and fifty out, you could then just go back to the larger portion oh, yes. and start another ABP, right? A- yeah. a- absolutely. Yes, exactly. You can top it up, a recast, oh, or, or do mate. another one. That stuff. Yep. Yeah. Mate, if I'm ever injured, I'm coming directly <laughs> to you. Hey, that's that's so cool. That. That is, uh, I love that kind of stuff. This is the I think the beauty of, of it, like you just said, is people don't have to sit in front of us too long to know that they're in the right place because 
Yeah. Especially if they've tried to talk to somebody else about it or tried to talk oh. to client, client services about how this works or it's so niche. It's so, and it's not even the theory, even if you know that well, you need, you need years of doing this and dealing with super funds and we know where the mistakes 100%. happen and how to, the implementation piece can be as important as the advice, you know? So it's, yeah. Well, it's, it is, I think it's a weird thing to be a specialist in, right? And I'm sure you probably agree to that because, because even though, and in, in, as you mentioned it, 20,000 people, um, you know, you claim a TP a TPB event it, it, within super each year. Um, that's still a really low percentage that it's, it's going not, to be one of your clients, yeah, right? Yeah, so, so then yeah. it doesn't really. And and this was the experience that I had was it's you know because I was always I I I loved to learn about uh, all of because superannuation is so interesting when you get into all of this stuff, right? It's it like these huge you know, wormholes that you can just crawl into and, and, and just discover all this amazing stuff and super like intellectually rewarding. However, if over the course of a 40 year period, you complete 10, you know, total permanent disability claims in your entire career for, you know, like the 80 to hundred families that you look after, like it just doesn't really make much sense to, to allocate a huge amount of time to doing it. And so, uh, and so I, I was aware that, that there are a lot of claims specialists out there that, that, it, that can help to get a good claim. But yeah, I've, I've actually never met someone yeah. who, who understood this space as, as well as you do. It is really narrow and it's really interesting to me. Like when you're at the bigger licensees, it's not a space they want to play in, right? I mean, of course there's a lot of claims that are small. You know, the average TPD amount through super might be 100000 So it's really hard to help people. And then you get the odd, you know, half a million, million, million and a half. You get the larger ones too, or you get the people with multiple claims or other complexity going on. But it's not, especially when it's licensees and, and, and where, you know, funds under management is the biggest target it's not mm. really a space they want to get into really it lends itself to a fee-for-service completely unconflicted model you yeah. actually can't be aligned with the product either because yep. you need to be able to tell people the rollover piece and locking in tax-free and stuff so it's it and and look there just aren't big numbers like you said Clayton I mean there's mm. quite a lot of claims every year but but a, a bunch of those people need the money desperately and all they need to know is how's the tax work is my centrally going to be impacted and Am I missing anything major? And for these people, we have a like a low cost consultation service where it's purely factual and general information, and we just be really clear on the you know what what this is and what it's not around the advice piece. Mm. Um, and, and like you say, there, there might only be five or ten percent of those that need holistic, ongoing advice and starting income streams and things like that. So that's always been the challenge: is how do you? And that's where the website has been fantastic. Like. I've got this website now. There's a free calculator on there. There's five videos answering the same question I get asked every day. You know, how does the tax work? How does the yeah. dental link work? What are the yeah. options here? And so I just try and give all that away through the website and that will be enough for most people. And then they start to self-select. They, they know I'm not missing anything. That explains it. I can do the tax calculator. I can check it. And then some people know that, yeah, if, they, if they're going to be using super going forward, they need advice pretty much like, yeah. And it kind of needs to be from us or someone in this area. Yeah. yeah. Um, so basically like what's the window where someone is a potential client? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, in this business, it tends to have to happen quite quickly after claim. Well, that's not entirely true, but that's just the way it goes. You, yeah. We want to talk to people. People want to get their hands on the money. They want to get their hands on the money and we definitely want to talk to them before they do anything. If they want to do a small withdrawal, but even a lot of people don't know that they can do partial withdrawals and keep making, I mean, it's, it's crazy. The lady I talked to yesterday, $700,000 claim, and she thought she had a one-off choice to withdraw it and she thought it was tax-free. She was looking at about 80 something thousand dollars in tax. And so it was all just this unfortunate people get to that point. They think it's TPD. TPD is tax-free or they think it's a flat 22%, and they're sort of both right and wrong, those answers. The TPD yeah. has no tax. It's the early withdrawal from super that creates the tax, and it is 22% on the taxable component, but there's this tax-free uplift. So it's it's usually we want to talk to people. They've just had a claim approved, and they're about to 
complete that withdrawal form or decide what to do with it. And then it depends. There's no real window beyond that. Like medicals will expire. So that's a big part of what we talk about. They might have other claims progressing. You know, they might another TPD claim or they might be personal injury or they might be on work cover. So sometimes they might want to wait several months until everything else finalizes. And if, if the medicals expiring is an issue, they have to get advice before that 12 months is up usually. They do definitely want to look at where that TPD money goes. Like if that massive TPD amount is getting invested, that's one of the key things they want to look at quickly. And look, they can engage us for advice on that piece or they can talk to their super fund or you know just be aware of that. Otherwise, there's no real window necessarily. So long as they can provide medicals that are valid and updated if they need to, they can still do it down the track. And some of these strategies, you sort of get one off, one go at it. So once you do roll over, you can't go and reprovide medicals and do it again. You know, that's that's tax avoidance. That's not tax reduction. So yeah, there's some some things like that. Yeah, yeah that's an that's an interesting thing. I know, I know that the ATO does give people, you know, it's occasionally they'll let things slide if there's mistakes, you know, genuine mistakes and. Mm. Um, in your in your opinion, that doesn't happen in this you know this area of of advice. If people make a mistake, is it pretty much unrewindable? Depends what you're talking about there. If they make a mistake, it like they've done a rollover of their rest account into it, that's pretty much unrewindable unless yeah. you can convince the fund that accepted it to reverse it out and send it back, mm. which we have had. But you've got to be on that really quickly. There's no leniency on the ATO on that kind of stuff. And, and even a withdrawal? What about a withdrawal? Can you No, it's really up to the, it? the fun- it's, <laughs> it's a good question. We, it's really up to the super fund. They're wow. the ones that calculate the tax and report it to the tax office. Name and shame, mate. Which one's the good one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, I won't go there, but I could. <laughs> um, the, it, there's mistakes all the time in the tax-free uplift calculation. And, oh, um, I, I think it would be. We, I've been doing this for you know solely for four and a half years, and they've picked up their game a lot because of how many complaints we've made, and someone had to. Oh, Andrew, keep him on hold. <laughs> it's it's Andrew again. Three hundred and ninety-five of the Andrew Xbox. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So that stuff can always be fixed up, but the the super fund has to fix it up. And sometimes they try and fob you off and say, go fix it up on your tax return. They can't do that because it's the super fund reporting the taxable income to them. So you've got to get them to fix it up. Mate, how how do you do it? How do you deal with the human element? How do you deal with the... the, Because to me, everything is achievable under law except one in 10 people that you speak to from these companies actually understands the rules. And so 90% of the time when you're having conversations at this level, it might be even worse. But the, I, I found that the more um, accurate and niche that advisors, including my own previous advice, was the more I found inefficiencies, inability to get the actual rules completed so how do you deal with the human element of these super uh you know specific uh rules and regulations look it's uh, always a challenge we have a number of extra steps throughout our process that other advisors wouldn't even think of because oh. we're always trying to cover off the and the errors are going to happen and we're going to have to fix them up the beauty of being so niche is i have a template email for all these errors i've usually got one before we do anything to say <laughs> Make sure this withdrawal is processed this way and this is our estimates of how it should be treated. The rollover from one fund to another, well, that goes wrong almost 40 or 50% of the time. So, so often we go, but we always send, we either send the, the request straight to the fund with a cover letter saying this needs to be treated as a disability super payment. So it needs to be unpreserved and blah, blah, blah. And then if if there are problems, the first thing we check when, you know, rollovers or withdrawals are processed is what were the tax components. So me and the staff, we're all very clear. That's that's a step in or every time we're implementing a client. So you can get onto it right away. There's a template for a withdrawal that was done wrong or a rollover that was done wrong. So it's all very <laughs> streamlined and templated and uh, and just very process driven. And it's absolutely crazy some of the funds and i won't name and shame but i mean i've had i had a fund last year it took me six months to get an eligible service date and i was given five different dates throughout that six months i'm like 
it's an eligible service date. How can it be that hard? I don't understand. And everyone gives a different tax rate, right? So, yeah, it's um, sometimes the big places are a bit siloed and their claims don't talk to the client services and it can be a real interesting mess sometimes. Um, yeah, which, 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 come, which makes me come back to this concept that I love it. Like, I, I really like what you've done because the, the, the issue I see for your business model, however, is client acquisition. A, uh, technically, you don't want it, right? No one wants, you know, to yeah, be... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you, you don't know, want you, to talk to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost like uh, you're, in a, you're in a position where um, things are rather unfortunate if, 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 if they've made their way to speak to you and your... And your yeah. Business. So uh, do you find your greatest acquisition of clients happens with your website and what you do publicly direct to consumer is it through claim specialists that are that are already out there is it through advisors like you know let's say i still have my business and i got a beer with you and then you know five years later one of my clients and i go oh there was andrew like uh you know like um or is it these legal firms or like for you, what is your best client acquisition channel? Because that, if you can answer this well, this question well, then there's so many business models that are out there and available to advisors that currently are impossible to run profit, profitably because the demand is so niche and so low. However, so, so that I guess that's probably the most in, and like amazing thing that I'm finding about this conversation is because it's so hyper niche. To me, that would freak me out to to have a business model based on it because I go, oh, like, yeah, how on earth am I going to get clients? Right. So I am really interested in how you get clients because it not only solves the problem for you, but for many advisors who mm. potentially might find themselves in a different, but um, still a hyper niche space. Yeah, that's great. I um, That's great because it has changed a fair bit. And when I started four and a half years ago, I very much didn't know if TPD would be the main focus or part of what I do. Would it be more general pre-retirement type planning, which is where I'd also been heavily exposed to at IPAC and, and Perpetual. And, and so um, I didn't know, but uh, I have had relationships with personal injury lawyers for many years. And um, that's, I mean, I had a few law firms saying we need a solution like this. So that was part of the, the reasoning to step out on my own and giving me the confidence. Um, and, and so I knew there would be some interest. And look, pretty quickly, that generated enough work to, to, for me to not do anything else except TPD. But what's happened, I mean, it is always hard to change firms and what they're doing and tell them that what you've been doing for 10 years is a bit of a risk here and and so that but the website now probably generates a bit more than half the inquiries and the people that go ahead with advice so the, the website has been a game changer wow Whereas before i'd have to be going to conferences and talking to lawyers and getting in front of them and trying to really keep front of mind it was tricky whereas the the website's probably only 18 months old and since Lee wow. and Fitzpatrick's in, in November last year, I've been ra- able to really ramp that up and put more on there and do more videos and things. And, What's and working, that, like written SEO blogs or video <laughs> explanations? Like, Look, I, I was doing SEO stuff for a little while but not long because, and that's been on hold forever because we're, we're pretty swamped. It is this um, it, SEO and there's just no one, if you go and Google it, we're ranked number one for TPD, uh, tax estimate or calculator or something like that. So that's a big one right. because everybody wants to know and they're all often misinformed. So that generates heaps of people. And then the, the next thing is I think the videos just give people a bit of peace of mind that when, I know what they, they get to see me. Uh, and it's, it's always hard too because I'm dealing with people everywhere. I very rarely meet these people face-to-face. I do occasionally, but often they're interstate or they're regional or so I think the videos have helped a lot. People and, and and so when people make an inquiry, we have a templated email that goes out and here's a tax estimator if you want to have a go at that. Here are some videos, frequently asked questions. Here's a checklist attached and it's got, it's too busy. It's got so many things that people can have a look at. And, and when they look at the videos, a lot of people said, thank goodness we found your website because I was so confused. Nobody knows what they're talking about. And so that, that's been huge, you know, so yeah. Awesome. So, and look, 
so I haven't done much beyond that. I mean, I've, I've talked to my new advisor about should we talk to advice groups and we've done a little bit of talking to super funds, but I haven't done much there because we've been so busy. I, yeah. I think I think you super would be a funds. thorn in their side. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could be that, and then there might be a conflict, and so I don't know how to go yeah. with that. But personally, I think super funds need to do more because sure, no, of course, the amount of people I meet that don't understand what they're doing when they sign that withdrawal form. That's right, is crazy. I mean, they need something to better educate these people, but yeah. it's a tricky one. Sometimes they haven't had a great relationship with the super fund anyway, and that might be a big trigger for these people just to go full withdrawal because I, you know, it's taken me two yeah. years to get this. So it's, yeah. it's a hard one, but yeah, the website and, and XY has been great there. I love the way, you know, the Ben Nashes and the pivot were and, and these really niche into their space. And yeah, yeah, that's, that's been what's helpful. And I could do more if I had had more time. Yeah. That's so interesting. So 50% from, yeah. And, and what you're saying right there, and it is super interesting is that, before the internet, it was all about who you knew locally and and mm. and who you could get your client to refer and you know and get them to bring you another client. That that essentially mm. was like local and mm. yellow pages and word to word, word of mouth. Word and, of mouth. And, and when the internet came along, and the longer that the internet's been around, it's about rather rather than being super flat and not very deep now it's super deep and and really narrow right so mm-hmm. and and so i can say these things but then it's it's always remarkable i mean it's a, it's a really it's a it's a systematic miracle the fact that your business model can exist right mm-hmm. the the fact that uh that you do such a niche thing and there just so happens to be enough people that fall into that in a per year capacity that, it, that it's a blue ocean that no one else is competing in this area, that you're really the only source of truth for the whole thing. And then to make it even better is, is, is you are what all advisors aspire to be, which is to deliver a, like a phenomenal financial and life outcome, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, it's it. So, it's one thing to sort of talk about it theoretically, um, but it's it's another entirely to sort of sit here and listen to to what your business model is in advice. It, it, it sort of reminds me of like like someone you know goes to med school and becomes uh, in, like a heart surgeon, and then oh, now I only deal in aortas. You know what I mean? Like, it's just it's like something is so. Uh, so niche that it's awesome that the internet allows your business model to flourish. I think that is re- like it's really promising, it, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Because if advice is what I suspect it is, and that is moving to a situation where tech will handle masses, advisors are moving more to this medicine approach of you know there'll always still be GPs, but you know, dermatologists and it is really cool to see it in action and, and, and happening. So, so if if internet gives you 50%, uh, is it, is it like the legal groups and your professional network that kind of fill in the other 50? That's right. Yeah. Most of them have come from the personal injury lawyers network and I have relationships with a number of them nationally, some big and some small. So that's where predominantly they were all coming from. And you're right. The internet has just allowed exactly i'm i'm very lucky that we can do that and and the internet because if i was just working on my local regional area i wouldn't have a business for sure no way, you know? no like, i wouldn't go this niche anyway yeah but because of that i can i can i can be the absolute expert in my very very narrow i, I had a laugh when you said surgeon because my new colleague and um, um he's another andrew which is a bit unfortunate but he yeah. um he, he's like me we used to work together he's one of the best advisors i've worked with and it's so technical and uh, he keeps getting blown away by how much we can do and help. And he keeps the surgeon. <laughs> so, so if someone wants to talk to um, him or I, he goes, no, I think they want the surgeon. You know, that's how he refers <laughs> to me. So, um, well, it, do- it doesn't surprise me just, just with the, the precision <clears throat> that, that, you're, that you're talking to uh, in this particular area. Now, let, let's say, um, and this goes back to your business model. Let's say, you know, uh, say, I don't know, for, let's say 100 people go through your service per year. What percentage of those stay on for 
retirement planning or for, you know, ongoing, let's call it traditional, dare I say it, compared to what we're talking about, financial advice. Like does your, does, let, let, let's say, for example, obviously, you know, if, if I have my own business and it happens to my client and I send them across to you, I'm sure it goes without saying, you'll shoot, you flick them back across to me and like, handle them again. But let's say for all these people that come in direct to you, um, do you do any traditional financial planning uh, after you've achieved this outcome for them? Yeah, that's a great question. No, so I still do uh, general and holistic financial planning and can do that. And, and my advisor who's joined me, um, that's his background too. And he's been super helpful to have that extra expertise as well. So look, we, yeah, I have two pretty different services. There's a very defined scope piece of advice because these people, they don't need, want to pull all their money out of super, but they don't want to risk the medicals or the Centrelink implications and the, and the tax thing. Yeah. So we might help those people and it might be one off and they can come back to us if they need our help going forward. Mm-hmm. And then there's the holistic advice. And a, a lot of these people have working partners and all the usual things that come with that. And, and they have larger settlements or multiple settlements and they need, need to segregate accounts or do more advanced strategies. And, and they're very likely to be long-term clients. You know, I think they just can see it's the usual reasons for needing an advisor ongoing and they yeah. can also see the added complexity of the TPD space. And like he's talked about, like recasting and future contributions and if they're on income protection, the deductible contributions and all, all those things. Um, so, so yeah, we, we, it might be half and half. Maybe half of them just need one-off advice, quite defined scope and narrow and the, and the other. And, yeah, and then there awesome. are a bunch of people that just need that first-off sort of factual information type session and that's all they need before they fill in that withdrawal form but that is sensational um look we're we're believe it or not we've actually kicked on through the the whole the whole hour mate Um, all right yeah 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 yeah. with (laughs) hey uh, because i know uh, i know when we'll we'll sat next to the um the zurich blue cocktail stand and i i'm (laughs) i'm I'm glad we got to cover a little bit of it but i tell you this was exceedingly it, it to me it gives me a lot of hope to see more and more of these business models i i mean such a fan, if you think of the sis act how much is going on in the sis act that that we get to use on a day-to-day basis like there's mm. there's there's a lot in there and we mm. we get to use about 10 15 percent of it kind of thing on on sort of a regular basis but the amount of different specialities that could come out of Mm. what is available to be done because of all Mm. the crazy levels of conflicting in some cases rules regulations across all the different aspects that financial advice covers yeah my hope is that an advisor or two is listening to this and then says i think i can go down this path of being known and delivering on this really specific thing because yeah, well, I mean, realistically, as soon as you said there's 20,000 people per year that's going to have a, a total from disability event inside of superannuation per year, I went, oh, I get it. I get that, you know, like that That makes a lot of sense. And, and if you're the guy that does that, yeah, you only, <laughs> what do you need? Like 0.1 of a percent to have an overwhelmingly large uh, business. And, and the number of different models, like I said, the CIS Act is, very complicated. The, the, the number of different versions of what you do is would be in the thousands. So, um, mate, uh, I hope that other advisors uh, can take the bravery that you've taken and uh, and take on take it on themselves. So, thank you so much for coming on and sharing. Um, yeah, I, I'm glad I got dragged out of retirement for this podcast. Thing, right? <laughs> hey, Clayton, massive thank you to you. I love what XY does, and it's absolutely helped me take that self-licensing and that really take the narrow niche to the next level. And, and I love the people in the group and the positivity. So awesome what you're doing. Thank you. Mate, thank you. All right. Take care. Speak soon. You too. See you, Clayton.